So Lori Morton, let me tell you a little bit about Lori Morton. And here's my, here is why Lori Morton is here to talk to you today. Is because every time I talk to her, she puts a smile on my face. She's had such a great journey. She's done so many cool things. And she just keeps moving the ball forward. And she's built an awesome company. I don't want to tell you about any of that. I'm going to let her tell you about the work that she's done. But she's a super cat. And I want you to give a round of applause. Ladies and gentlemen, Lori Morton. Thank you. Yeah, I think I've got it. Sounds a little loud. Um, when Phil asked me to speak today, I said, what in the world can I talk about? What would people like to hear? And Phil said, Lori, just tell your story. And I started thinking about that, Phil, and my story and your story really starts out the same. I was born short and bald. <laughs> <laughs> path deviate from there. I still have a microphone. <laughs> now you know how not to get asked back again. Um, I, I wanted to start with a rule to live by. Um, first, a show of hands. Who knows of the golden rule? Tell everyone who knows the golden rule. Raise your hand. Come on. Most people know the golden rule. Treat others the way you would like to be treated. And it's a sweet rule we're taught that when we're children in kindergarten or church or our parents. I'm going to ask you to step it up a level. How many people in here know the platinum rule? Raise your hand if you know the platinum rule. Can you recite it? What's the platinum rule? Treat people the way they want to be treated. Treat people the way they want to be treated. Now think about that for a minute. We all know how we would like to be treated. That's not so hard. But to understand how someone else would like to be treated, we have to stop for a minute. We have to put some effort into it. We have to listen. We have to seek to understand. If we all tried to follow the platinum rule, the world would be a better place. So remember the platinum rule. It's important. My story, um, I was fortunate enough to get a basketball scholarship, which took me to college. I, I came from a poor family and might not have gone to college otherwise. In those first two years at Belmont Abbey, I majored in recreation, and that was fun. Um, I took tennis, backpacking, and golf. It was all required for my major. It was awesome. <laughs> then when I transferred to NC State, all of those rec classes I took transferred as PE credits. I think you need two PE credits to graduate from NC State. I had like 28, <laughs> so you think I played the whole time. My first year at NC State was in 1983. And a lot of you probably are too young to remember, Jimmy Valvano led the cardiac pack to the national championship, NCAA championship. And if you don't know the story, it's amazing. The team was 11 and 14 going into the ACC playoffs. Every game they won in the playoffs was down to the wire. They won in overtime, double overtime, triple overtime. It was amazing. And every single victory, the whole place celebrated like crazy. That was the best party, biggest party I've ever been to. But what I got from that, the takeaway is a little bit of faith and a lot of effort can get you to your goal. Effort is so important. So when I left NC State, a couple of great things happened. One, I got a job at Michelin Tire here in Greenville. Does anyone here work at Michelin or used to work at Michelin? Great. This is a wonderful company. So that was a good thing. The second good thing didn't seem so much so at the time. Michelin put me on the factory floor in maintenance. And at first, I was miffed. I mean, you know, I had an engineering degree. I felt like I should have an office or at least a cubicle and a computer. I didn't. I was in central maintenance. I went to the floor every day and worked with the maintenance techs. The reason that turned out to be good is actually life-changing for me because first, I came to find out how much those maintenance techs knew. It was amazing how much they knew about that equipment. Secondly, I was amazed at how rarely did engineers ask their opinion. I saw it over and over again. And eventually, I got into that cubicle upstairs. I had my own computer, and I could see a window from where I was. And every time I got a project, I pulled the drawings, I studied it, and then I went down on the floor and I talked to the maintenance techs. I said, what do you think? Here's what we need to do. What this did for me is, one, gave me great ideas. I wouldn't have thought of all those things by myself, but secondly, the maintenance techs felt heard. They felt valued. 
So they made every project I had shine. I'm no better engineer than the next person. I'm not perfect by any means. But you would think I was. All my projects went so well. And it was because I had the maintenance techs on my side. So without even knowing it, I was applying the platinum rule. I was listening to them. I was seeking to understand their world. So after Michelin, I went to work at Fujifilm, and that was a great opportunity for me. I tell people that Michelin taught me how to be an engineer. I was there eight years. If you work there, you know there's a lot of structure, a lot of processes. They tell you, here's how you run a project. Here are the meeting minutes you send out. So when I went to work at Fuji, I was the maintenance manager. And right away, I went to Japan for three months for training, which was amazing. That's a whole other story over a beer. And right after I got there, my boss told me my main job was to install all the equipment in the factory. It was a brand new plant. They just poured the concrete. And wow, how exciting is that? Now, you know at Michelin, if you install one piece of equipment, there's a spec book that's probably an inch thick that tells you everything you need to do to install that piece of equipment. So obviously, I asked my boss. I said, Hashimoto-san, can I please have specifications? And he kind of looked at me puzzled, and I said, you know, so I can install the equipment. Because after all, I could read these at night in the hotel. I had plenty of time. He kind of walked away puzzled, and a few days passed. I think on Friday, I asked him again. And he again kind of looked puzzled and walked away. The next week, he came up just beaming. And he said, Lori-san. I have specifications. It was one piece of paper with the names of the 38 machines. <laughs> so that gives you an idea how different that was. At Michelin, I learned to follow the rules. I learned the value of a process. I learned the value of a structure. At Fuji, I exercised a part of my brain I never had before. I had to think on my feet. I had to try and figure out what would make the most sense. What kind of meetings should we have? What metrics should we follow? I don't know if I would have been prepared to start my own company right from Michelin. I needed to have that experience where I had to hit the ground running and I had to think. Now, in 1998, the stars lined up for me. I saved my money, and I was prepared to live for a couple of years without salary. And if any of you have leapt from corporate America to start your own business, you know how scary that can be. So that was important, that I could live without needing that regular two-week paycheck. When I first started ARI, probably like a lot of people, I thought, well, people are going to come running. I know a lot of people. I know people at Michelin. I know people at Fuji. And that didn't really happen. My first employee was my brother, Reg, and he's a very talented AutoCAD designer. He designs houses. I designed equipment. Our first jobs at ARI for the first three or four months were like rush drafting jobs. We would get jobs for architects that were behind schedule, so he and I would pull all-nighters to get drawings done and then we could invoice $400. So it was not the excitement and the fame and the fortune I thought it would be. So then about five months into the company, I had a great opportunity, and that's to meet with someone at GE. Um, does anyone here work at GE or have worked at GE? Yeah, I work at GE. <laughs> and this man, I'd found out he needed some CAD work done, some drafting work. So I called and called, so I got him on the phone, and he agreed to have a meeting with me. So if you've ever been to that facility on Garlington Road, the middle entrance there, you walk in, and security's on your right, and, and just a wall on your left. There's no benches, no, no water fountain or anything like that. My meeting was 10 o'clock. I came to till. I wanted to be early. And I told them who I was meeting with. And they called Frank, didn't answer his phone. Called his beeper, no response. Called his, his secretary, no answer. So 10 o'clock came around, they tried again, no answer. 10.15, they paged him again, no answer. 10.30, no answer. I'm starting to get frustrated. I'm standing against the wall staring at the security people the whole time. You can't go anywhere. But I was not going to leave until I met with Frank. 10.45, they called him again, no answer. 11 o'clock, no answer. Finally, about 10 minutes after 11, Frank comes rushing in there. And if any of you know Frank, it, a type A personality is an understatement. He is a high energy guy. And he said, oh, I was in a meeting, sorry. I don't have much time. I'll tell you what I need as we walk through to my office. So as we walked through the factory, he was saying, upstairs, I need a full CAD drawing done. I want to see every cubicle, every desk, every return, every partition, every shelf. He said, we have 52 engineers upstairs, and I need to add 10 more. So I want you to come up with a CAD drawing. So I'm thinking the whole time we're walking. We get up to his office and sit down, and he said, when can you have that done? 
Now that would have been a sweet drafting job for my company. You know, a company like GE on your resume list would be great, and I'm sure they would pay a lot more than what I've been charging for rush jobs. But in good conscience, I couldn't accept it. I said, Frank, who did you buy your cubicle furniture from? I, I forgot what he said, maybe Steelcase. And I said, I bet if you call them, they have a drawing, and likely they'll reconfigure your layout for you just so you'll buy more furniture from them. And he said, wow, I hadn't thought about that. Thank you. You just saved me a lot of time and money. <laughs> Great. After all that time trying to meet with Frank, after waiting for him for an hour and a half, in five minutes I just talked him out of hiring us. So I had to think fast. You know, I imagine his world was just being really fast placed, constantly things happening, the way he walked, the way he talked. So I decided to listen to what his needs were. I said, Frank, what problem do you have that you can't solve? What keeps you up at night? And he kind of sat back a minute and he said, wow, he said, my facility drawings. He said, we're going through all kind of renovation. We have two different archives. I can't find anything. Can you solve that for us? Well, you know, engineers, we, we never walk away from a challenge. We like a problem. And I said, sure. So he walked me across the hall, introduced me to Hazel, the archivist. I spent the rest of the day looking at drawings between the two archives rooms. I didn't know how I was going to do it. Um, I've talked to scanning vendors in town. I've learned about file formats and file types and compression and all that. I bought a book, Microsoft Access for Dummies, <laughs> and I read it. And I put a proposal out there to, to GE. And to me, it could have been $2 million. I think it was like $40,000 proposal. That was huge, huge to me. But that was my best shot at what it would take to get all his drawings in a searchable, organized system. And to my delight, they accepted the proposal. And the project was a huge success. They loved it. The purchasing agent, her husband worked at Alcoa Fujikura. They had drawings. They needed help with their drawings. And word of mouth just spread. And we started to grow. My initial offerings for area engineering was machine design, AutoCAD work, maybe some technical writing. But very quickly, I found out almost everyone struggles with drawings. They struggle with it. I tell people now that we're not a document management company. We're an engineering company. We just happen to be really good at document management. So because of that one incident with Frank, that one time I stopped to listen to what his needs are, it completely directed my company. Now our document solutions division is our largest division. We have clients like Greenville Hospital, St. Francis, GE is still a big client, um, Brady Hospital Atlanta, um, Greenville Schools, Charleston Schools, Richland Schools, Michelin, Robert Bosch, big companies, they need help managing their paper. So that's our future, but I had to listen. I had to put the effort in, I had to understand his world, and I had to listen. That's how the platinum rule can help, you see? If you do all those things, if you follow that rule and you learn all that information, the next thing you need to do with that is figure out what is your advantage. What's your competitive advantage? What is your value proposition? Whether you have your own company or you work for someone else, you still need to know your value proposition. Um, Gil Gerritsen is one of my mentors, BizTrack, maybe some of you know Gil. And he says there's five areas, and you need to pick one that you're really good at. One is technology. If you have better technology than everybody else, Price, are you cheaper than everyone else? Convenience, are you easier to find, easier to use? Quality, is your quality better than everyone else? Or service. At ARI, our competitive advantage is our service. Not only do we have a great software that makes it easy for people to find what they need, but we actually help our customers get all the information into the library because they're too busy. We know enough about their world. We understand their world well enough to know what they need, so we help them. We make their worlds better. In our company, one thing we instituted about a little over a year ago, just to keep service front of mind, because it's, it's easy to say it, but, but it doesn't always happen. So you need to, need to keep talking about it. We have something called MCC meetings. And those are weekly meetings where we, everyone in the company that's there on that day stands up, and it's a 10 or 15 minute meeting. We have a chart on the wall in the middle of the office, and we list all of our customers down this chart. And then we have the months of the year going across to the right. Everyone picks a color, the first of the year. And each time you have a meaningful customer contact, you put a dot for that customer for that month. We all look at the chart. We go around the room. Everyone has a chance to say something about a meaningful customer contact. A book, our bookkeeper gets excited when she gets checked. She'll say, that's meaningful. 
And we all decide which, which contacts are meaningful. Is it a phone call? Is it an email that was answered? Did we bump into them at the Clemson football game? And they said, hey, you did great, whatever. And then we look at this chart and we look for white spaces. Where we have white spaces, we have a problem. That means we're not reaching out to our customer. Are we really bringing them the right value? Are we really being service oriented if we're not touching them in any way? We had one customer last year that was particularly prickly, kind of hard to reach and touch. So we had about three months there where there were no marks in that box. So as a team, we all talked about it. Well, geez, what can we do? How can we reach them? And so the idea was, let's send them a tray of cookies. So we did. We sent a tray of cookies to the maintenance techs. They loved it. They loved it. They called right away and thanked us. How thoughtful of us to think of them. So if that's your angle, make sure you practice it. You have to make it part of your culture. I have people ask me often about what it's like to run a business. Who in here has their own business? Wow, a lot of people. And if you started from scratch, then this may sound familiar to you. I think there are a lot of analogies between running a business and raising a child. You can read books on being a parent, read lots and lots of books, you can read books on running a business, but it's not till you actually live it do you fully understand. In the beginning, when your company is new, you do everything. That company is in its infancy. You have to do everything. You do all the work. You invoice. You clean the toilets. You buy the paper for the copier. Everything. But then as that company starts to grow, you need to instill your values, just like you would a child. You need to start to create a culture for that company. So you start to put some foundation in place. You start to put some structure. And as that company grows more and starts to mature, they become more independent. So you've got to hope that you've got the right people making the right decisions. I tell people all the time, I've really got two kids. I've got Ari Engineering and my son Case. Ari is a teenager now and starting to drive, and I can't micromanage. If I do that, the company will never go anywhere. And we have amazing, amazing goals for this year. We are just primed to skyrocket. We've got great software. We've got great people. That's the other thing I'd love to say to you guys. Surround yourself with great people. Not only the people you work with, but the people that you mentor with and you interact with, like Phil, like Russ Davis. Surround yourself with great people. So, I mean, that's really what I have to say. Um, put the effort in, stop and listen, and seek to understand your customers, your internal, external customers. So, open the floor to questions. I want to. <laughs> You have a great story about how contact, repeated practice, makes you get to a place. I'd love for you to tell that tale. Oh, which story? I can't remember. The basketball. Oh. Um, OK, when, when I was a kid, like a lot of kids, I ran around and rode bikes and climbed trees and that kind of thing. And in seventh grade, they had basketball tryouts. I had never played basketball, but it sure looked like fun. So I decided to try out for the team. Somehow I made the team. I was the 12th girl they kept on the seventh grade team, and I was third string. So I never played the entire year. It wasn't any good, but I liked it. So when eighth grade rolled around, I decided to try out again. I made the team again, third string. The entire year, I scored one basket. I had two points the entire year. At the end of this eighth grade year, I was really discouraged because I decided I liked basketball. So ninth grade, I decided I was going to try really hard. So I tried out for the team in ninth grade. I made the team. Third string again. Halfway through the season, the first string girl got a D in math, so I bumped up the second string. <laughs> so luck helps. The entire year, I scored a total of 13 points. And at the end of that ninth grade year, I realized going into 10th grade, they only had two teams, varsity and junior varsity. So my chances of making the team just dropped by a third. And I really liked the game. I mean, I, I think I loved it. I loved this game. Why wouldn't they let me play more? Why couldn't I be better? So I made a vow to myself at the end of the ninth grade season to touch a basketball for an hour a day until tryouts in the 10th grade. So every day, all summer, I had my basketball. Sometimes I just walk around doing this with the basketball. I went to softball tournaments. I took my basketball with me. I would run and dribble with one hand, run and dribble with the other hand. There were even times I slept with my basketball. 
but it was important to me, an hour a day. So when 10th grade tryouts rolled around, I was so nervous. I really had not played. I'd just been touching a ball all summer. Now, not only did I make the team in the 10th grade, but I was a team captain in 11th and 12th grade and led the team in scoring and ended up getting a full basketball scholarship. So the reason I tell that story, I, I tell, told it when I gave the commencement address, it's sometimes not enough to love something. It's sometimes not enough to want it really, really badly. You have to work at it. So if you pick something that you love, that you want, the next thing is start working at it. I think if you put an hour a day into it, you can hit your goal. Thanks. And it's open to questions. Price, service, technology, quality, and convenience. <laughs> um, my best friend from college was running a marathon in Alaska, and she asked me to go with her. And so I went to my boss, and I said, Hashimoto-san, I would like to take a week vacation. And he said, ah, Lori-san, I think maybe you're too important to be gone. I think maybe no. <laughs> yeah, and that did it. I was this close already, but I was not that important. I ended up getting a job in Alaska and staying for the whole summer. So it, was, it was a great call. <laughs> I almost never came back. That's an excellent question. Repeat it. How do you infuse culture, aka your vision, your values, into the company? Culture trumps everything. I don't care how many procedures you have in place, how much you talk about it, culture trumps everything. So establishing that culture is so important. A couple of things we do, if we get into a situation and we're going to deliver something and it's not the right thing for our customer, or if we have to go back and redo work, I tell our folks, we'll lose money to do the right thing for the customer. I honestly believe if we do the right thing for the customer, it's going to pay off in the end. So you can't be short-sighted enough to look at each little step. You've got to look at the big picture. Another thing that's important is um, mistakes. See, I happen to think that uh, it takes a good seven years before you reach a steady state with your company. And that's not really anything to do with how smart you are or your ideas. It has to do with the fact that you have to make enough mistakes to figure out your path. So at ARI, we actually, we don't get upset when people make mistakes because everyone makes mistakes. If, no one, if you're not making mistakes, you're not trying to do things. You're not trying to innovate. So people don't get in trouble for making mistakes. When a mistake happens, me, someone else, what we do in our weekly team meeting, we talk about it. Well, this happened. We dropped the ball. The customer called. This happened. How can we make sure we don't do that again? So we create a culture where it's OK to make mistakes, where people don't get worried or scared or, or hide from it. So almost celebrating those mistakes. I think to instill the culture and the values you want, you have to talk about it a lot. So you bring it up often. Here's what we're doing and why. The customer is important to us. We need to understand what they're doing, why they need our help. And I think trying to emulate those values is really important. Um, I've heard it called the shadow of the leader. But if I say, you know, top quality, but then I don't do top quality, then that's huge. So you have to speak it often, and you have to do it. <laughs> do you know what Aerie is? Does anyone know what an Aerie is? Walter? Yeah, Walter does crossword puzzles a lot. <laughs> an airy is an eagle's nest, an eagle's airy on a rock cliff. And my older brother, Reg, um, you can kind of think of him like a skinny grizzly Adams. He goes out in the woods for months at a time. 
And he had a vision one time. He was soaring with eagles. That became his spirit, his totem. And he came up with the name Airy when he and I were talking about building houses. Back when I was still at Fuji, he and I were going to create a company building houses. And we thought, Airy Designs, how cool, a nest, you know, design. So when rubber hit the road and I went to Alaska and I had to start this business, I needed a name. And I thought Airy Engineering kind of had a nice ring to it. The only problem is people can't spell it. <laughs> but now you know, if you do crossword puzzles, it'll come up every now and then. That's a good question. That's like art versus science question. Um, I think you need both. I think if you trust one exclusively, then you'll get yourself in trouble. Um, I think in the beginning, it was more gut. It was more art. That's what I felt we should do. Um, as our company grows and matures, now we have a CFO on board, and he gives me tons of great data. So now I might lean towards my gut, then I get numbers from him. So it's definitely a combination. At different points in the life of Ari, it swayed a little bit. And there have been a few times I trusted my gut and it wasn't the right thing. So I don't think there's a real clear answer other than you need both half of your brains engaging. The tools, the tools kind of get you started. The tools give you a guideline. Um, there's three things my company does. One is the document management piece that I've mostly talked about. The second is machine design. But the third piece is knowledge management. And, and that's pretty exciting stuff. We help companies understand what it is that they have that's not well documented, what's in people's heads. Um, we help them understand where they're at risk. So we've developed some tools to help them do that, some prioritization tools. Um, some templates that you use when you try and gather that data. Now, tools by themselves don't do much. Um, so much of it is culture. We go into some companies and they have a culture of not sharing because of job security. And when we run into those cultures, it's much harder. You know, no matter what tool you have, like I said, culture is going to trump. So you really need both. You need to create a culture in your company where it's okay to share information, and then. Once you have that culture, you need some vehicle, some way of, of gathering it, extracting it, and creating that standard, like what Michelin is so good at. So it really takes both. I'm not sure if I answered your question. <laughs> OK. Um, I like going as high in the company as I can, talking to the owner. I want to hear what they think is important to them. So that's one of the first things I do when we're looking at a new vendor. Um, I want to make sure that they're high in service as well. I value service, just like I think my clients value service. So I would rather have a vendor that did an exceptional job with service than, than was 10 cents cheaper than the next. So I think as soon as you start basing all your decisions on something like price, you're going to miss out on some really important things. So the owner, trying to understand their values, and if service is important, those are two big ones. Yeah. Yeah. We find that the genre clients that need us most are hospitals. So our strategy is to meet our clients where they hang out. Like it, um, they have, there's hospital association for engineers, hospital engineer conferences. So we go to those a lot. Um, and we find that the higher up in the organization we go, the more they value what we have to offer. So the V level, the C level is where we start. All right, I've got a question for you. So as you told your tale, 
you said that you know you had you had an idea about what your business was about, mm -hmm. but you clearly reached an inflection point, right? You go to a customer, someone's willing to write you a forty thousand dollar check for something which you didn't think was your business when you walked into it. Right. In retrospect, it's clear that you realized that as an inflection point. Did you know it at the time? Did you see the pivot there? No, I didn't. I just saw an opportunity to do something cool, something I hadn't done before. I mean, so how did you know? How did you get to the point then, you know, what, having done that, I mean, at some point you made a decision. It's like, you know what, I'm no longer someone who sits around. We're not going to draw things for people. We're going to manage the stuff they've drawn already. How did you make that decision? It, well, it came in steps, I think. Um, about two or three months into that project at GE was when Alko Fujikura came to me and said, hey, we need help too. And that's when I had, aha, wow, maybe there's an opportunity here. So all that was great, and it really took the next big step up, I would say, in um, 2004, 2005, when we launched our web-based version, Airy Hub, and I realized we could charge reoccurring revenue, monthly revenue, to have all this information for our clients. And that's when I went, wow, this is the ticket. If you can figure out a business model where you can have that reoccurring revenue, where the customer knows they're going to pay and knows they're going to get this value, then that's golden. I didn't think there's a real plus for that, because I think in tech, a lot of times people don't get that, right? I mean, we, we've come out of a sort of break-fix mentality, mm -hmm. you know, where so, someone needs a thing, we come out, we do a small project. We come out, we do a small project. And the thing is, that can be hard to stabilize that income. Very hard. Um, you know, I've heard you uh, reflect some insight into that, that at some point, right, once you've got to this recurring revenue model that you're dealing with, that it's below a pain threshold for the client. And that way, you are repeatedly solving a problem for them that they no longer are wrestling with you about what it costs. Right. And there's some real brilliance in that, right? Oh, yeah. That's great. They see, we, we become a partner with our clients. Um, we come in and we say, we'll take care of whatever you need. You just let us know what you need. Um, and the other tidbit I learned just in the last couple of years, less detail is better. Um, years ago, yeah. I used to put every single line item on the invoices all the way down to the penny because... Of course, everyone wants to know details. And what I've learned over the years is when you give your customers a lot of details like that, they're going to focus on the details. They're going to focus on the pennies. So a couple of years ago, I completely changed that. Our invoices now read professional services January 2016. And it's an amount that they know is coming. They've agreed to it. So they never squabble with it. And then we bring the value to the table. We bring that service aspect. I guess in that lesson, for the lesson there is, don't create any snags, right? I mean, because right. I mean, that's really what you're doing there. I mean, it's something that just trips you up, and it's not doing anything. And, and you already, I mean, I'm going to tell you, the thing that I wrote down from today, I've learned two things that I didn't, I've never heard you say before. But one of the things I wrote down today was this whole thing about the uh, customer meetings, you know, actually saying, are we, oh, do we have meaningful customer contact? and looking for the white spaces. And I don't think I ever thought about that. I always feel like, I'm doing a good job. I've talked to this one, I've talked to this one. And I don't ever spend the time thinking about, wait a second, where are the holes in my strategy? And if those, if, if I were face to face with those, I think I'd be a lot less comfortable about what I was doing. Visibility is huge, having it in front, so you think about it. Yeah, I love the way you think. Ladies and gentlemen, Lori Morton. Thank you. I'm sorry, I've just used the microphone, aren't I? That was awesome, wasn't it? One, yeah, I know. One more time for Lori Morton. I'm delighted to call her friend. And with that, I think it would be entirely appropriate for you to come up here, shake her hand. I'm going to tell you, we didn't write her a check, so you can come up at least say thank you, right, and be nice to her. And uh, I'll tell you what, we're doing Tech After Five tonight. If that's your kind of thing, let me buy you a beer. We'll see you tonight, and we'll see you here next month. Thanks a lot.